Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Marie, and, and thank you for Connie and Marie for in, inviting me out today. Can I bend this or turn it? Is that okay? Or sound guy's going to kill me? I'll just keep it like that. <laughs> so we have, we have been so filled spiritually today, haven't we? And now we've been filled physically. So I hope we can continue in, in that vein and, and that the Lord would just continue to meet with us and show us who he is because it's not about who Jana is or Janie or Karen or Patty or Jeanette or anyone else. It's about who Jesus is because when it's all said and done, that's all that's left. Amen. So I want to ask you guys somewhat of a rhetorical question. Do you believe in God's sovereignty? Do you believe that Jesus is and was sovereign when he walked among us, knowing the end from the beginning? For those of you that know the account of the rich young ruler, do you believe that Jesus knew this man was going to walk away from Jesus before Jesus even spoke with him? Because the, gro the cross that Jesus was asking this man to bear was just too much for him? Let's look at how Jesus treated this man, the rich young ruler. And I know we're studying 1 Corinthians 13 today, and we're going to get there in just a moment. But if you will, please turn with me to Mark chapter 10, and we're going to start reading in verse 17, and we're going to read through verse 22. Mark 10, 17 through 22. Now, as Jesus was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to Jesus, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I really want to notice Verse 21 that says, Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Ladies, are we able to do that? Can we love even if? So now let's turn to our main text, 1 Corinthians 13. I'm going to sip on the same water bottle that all the other ladies have been drinking off of. No, just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but I am going to open one because I do get very thirsty. Um, so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're going to look at verse 1. And it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And here's another rhetorical question, ladies. Do you believe every word of the Bible is true? So do we believe it when we hear love never fails? So I've been asked to share my testimony, and I, I pray and hope that as, as you hear me share, that you will see the difference of God's word being revealed to me through the sound of clanging brass versus its revelation through love. So I'm 50 years old, which means I was born in 1966, and all that to say is back then we didn't have playdates. We played with neighborhood kids, and that's what I did, and in my neighborhood there were five boys and me. And from the earliest I could remember, I thought I was one of those boys. Not in a tomboy kind of way, I literally, deep inside, 
thought I was a boy. I was just like them. I walked the same. I talked the same. I excelled at sports just like they did. And it was around maybe five or six years old that I started becoming even more confused about my gender because now I recognized that my body was different than theirs. In my mind, there wasn't any difference between us, so when I recognized that my body was different, I became very confused. And not only did this confuse me, it made me very, very angry. I started having anger issues at a very, very young age. I did not want to be stuck in this girl's body. And that angered me and it confused me and I was so mad that I started to self-injure at like five or six years old. I was also angry and confused because of the relationship that I saw inside my home where no one else could hear and no one else could see. And I watched my father belittle my mother over and over and over again in front of us kids telling her you're useless and you're worthless and you're crazy. You're so crazy I'm going to drop you off at the nut house and never pick you, pick you up. And I believed him because he was my dad. And I thought when we were driving, is this going to be the last time I see my mom? Is this when he's going to drop her off? I watched my mother manipulate my dad, so to me, my perception was that she didn't trust him. Because if she trusted him, why would she have to manipulate him, right? So that perception led to the deception in my, in my mind that no man could be trusted. I didn't really feel close with either parent, I didn't feel close with anyone except the boys that were in my neighborhood and I was starting to feel odd around them because I was in a sense mad at them because they had everything that I wanted if, if you understand what I'm saying by that. And I didn't want to be like my mom who was the only representation of femininity to me because I thought if I was going to be like her then I would literally be like her being worthless and crazy and stupid and I did not want that. I already felt bad enough so I detached myself from my mother thus detaching myself from femininity altogether. I didn't want to spend time with my dad who was the embodiment of all men to me. He was the embodiment of masculinity because he was so mean and so angry and I hated, I hated the way he treated my mother and really all women. He was like that with all women. It's just to my mom, it was to the nth degree. Again, as a child, we believe everything we hear our parents say. So because of this, it skewed my view of femininity and masculinity and my perception of my gender identity was now flawed. And I just want to say, ladies, I don't have this in my note, but I feel like the Lord wants me to share this with you. Saying all this, this is what the Lord has shown me after. After I sat at his feet and asked him many, many questions, <coughs> excuse me, which you'll hear about shortly. But I wasn't walking around at six years old going, you know, I'm feeling like I'm kind of detaching from my mom. I bet you that's going to skew my view of gender. So... <laughs> When you have these children in your life, whether it be your own children or your nieces and nephews or neighbors and their friends, and you see the little boy playing with dolls or the little girl you know, running around with a baseball glove on her hand and you just kind of might have that feeling, I bet you they're gonna grow up to be gay. Understand they don't know what's going on. Love them right where they are. Don't force them into doing something that's not fun for them, but encourage them where they are. So if it's, a, if it's a little boy that's maybe dancing around, tell him, you know what, some of the greatest dancers were m men, and they grow up to be big and strong, and you can be an awesome man someday if you want to be a dancer. And to the little girls that are, you know, athletic, say, you know what, there's some really awesome, you know, female athletes out there, and just, you know, encourage them where they are instead of trying to change them, because even at that little age, they're going to recognize what you're trying to do. Does that make sense? Okay. So to make matters even more confusing for me, 
starting at a very young age, I was being sexually violated. So in my mind, in my mind, because I had to make sense of this, in my mind, I thought this only happened to little girls. Certainly this doesn't happen to little boys. So I thought if I could somehow really become a boy and sit there and make my body turn into a boy, this would stop. And that's how I thought that I could protect myself. I was being deceived right from the get-go. My life was being built on a foundation of deception. By the time I was 10 or 11 years old, maybe 12, I don't necessarily remember the exact time, but I was young, I started recognizing that I liked girls in a special way. And I didn't necessarily know what that was, but I know it scared me. I did not want it. I tried to think it away. I tried to make it go away. I didn't know what to do with that. And I was having these daydreams and these fantasies of what it would be like to, to have a girlfriend. I was so confused. And we have to remember now, this is now the 1970s. There was no one to talk to back then. No, was, no one was talking about these issues. We didn't go to church. My family wasn't saved. We didn't go to church. But even if we did, if I would have went into the church and explained what I was going through, they would have either kicked me and my family out or they would have sent me to some take the gay away camp and slept lipstick on my face and put me in a dress and said, pray it away, now here you go. And that wouldn't have helped. Thank God there wasn't computers back then, or at least in every home like now, because if I would have typed in, how do you know if you're gay? A plethora of lies would have come in and it would have fed into that foundation. It would have built on that foundation of deception. All I'd ever heard was that gay people were sick and disgusting and to stay away from them. So this made me feel completely isolated and alone. So again, taking matters into my own hands, I started drinking at 12 years old, heavily drinking. And, you know, I, I was one of those very thin children, so I, I, I drank like an adult would drink at that age. And when I was 13, I started doing drugs. I would come home drunk often and throw up, probably because I was so tiny, ingesting so much alcohol. And my mom would clean up the mess and put me to bed. And the next day I would wake up thinking I was going to get in trouble, but we didn't really talk about it. See, in my house we just swept everything under the rug, so my perception was that I wasn't loved. After all, I thought, my parents, if, if they loved me, wouldn't they, wouldn't they talk to me about this? Wouldn't they tell me to stop? Again, that's more deception because the truth was my parents loved me. They just didn't handle that situation the right way. The drug and the alcohol abuse continued, so much so that by the time I was 17 years old, I had done over 30 hits of LSD I was doing, which is a hallucinogenic, it's a powerful, it's got like rat poison and stuff in it. it one hit could send you away to a, you know, a place in your mind that you could never come back. And I did over 30 by the time I was 17 years old. And every other drug I could find because I did not want to be sober because when I was sober, I was in so much pain and confusion because again, I want to reiterate, I did not want to be gender confused and I did not want to be same sex attracted. So as soon as I graduated high school, by the grace of God, I have no idea how I got through high school, but I graduated. My sister, who's 14 years older than me, uh, lived in Florida with her family. I was living in New York, and she came up, and she grabbed me, got me out of the house, and shortly after living in, in Florida with her, I went to a party, which wasn't odd. I partied a lot. But this party was different because at this party, a guy asked me out on a date. Now, a guy had never asked me out on a date before. I didn't know what to do with that. I, I had been sexually active at all the parties that I went to, but I'd never literally went out on a date with anyone. And I thought, you know what? If, if I go out on this date with this guy, maybe my same-sex attraction will go away. Maybe my gender, maybe I'll, I'll feel like a woman then. So I went out with him, and it was out on our first date that he proceeded to tell me that he was just released from prison. So you would think 
that I would run in the opposite direction of that. But I had such low self-esteem and I couldn't believe that someone was showing me attention. So I continued dating him and just about one year later, we ended up getting married. I was 19 years old and he was 27. And then not long into the marriage, he started to physically abuse me. So again, now my perception of all men are bad, no men could be trusted was just fueled, fueled by this abuse. Again, that's deception that was caused by sin because not all men are bad, but man, oh man, can you understand why I thought that? So after a couple of years in this marriage, I ended up filing for a divorce. And at this point in my life, I was as confused as ever. I felt like I'd given the whole being straight thing a shot. I failed at it miserably, and it didn't take away my same-sex attraction like I had hoped it did. So I moved away, and that's when I fully came out as a lesbian. And please hear me when I tell you this. When I came out is when I felt freedom for the first time in my life, and that freedom was real to me. I felt free because I was doing anything that I wanted. I felt free because I was no longer pushing down these guttural desires that I'd had for as long as I could remember. But just because I felt free doesn't mean I was free. I felt free because I was doing anything I wanted, but I was being deceived. I thought that doing anything I wanted was freedom, but actually I know now that it was bondage. I was so deep in deception. I was so deep in deception that I didn't even think that what I was doing was sin. At first it was great. I had tons of one-night stands. I had a couple of short-term relationships. I finally felt like I fit in somewhere. I was finally accepted and I wasn't judged and I now had a family and it was the LGBT community. And let me tell you, they embraced me and I embraced them. But eventually all those one-night stands and rocky short-term relationships um, it became lonely even in that, and I, and I realized that I wanted to, to meet someone and spend the rest of my life with her. I just, I wanted to meet the woman of my dreams, fall in love, and live life together. And you know why? Because that's normal. That's normal. Everyone wants to meet that special person and spend the rest of their lives with them. I was no different. So I thought I met that person in the late 1990s. As soon as we met, we hit it right off. Both of us knew very quickly into the relationship that this was going to be it, that we were going to spend the rest of our lives together. So we, we lived together for a while, and, and then we bought a home. And we lived in that home for about four years. And then we started thinking, you know, we started talking with each other, and it's like, you know, I kind of want to look into spiritual things and we were reading, you know, different books on spirituality. And I just want to say, Karen talked about uh, Confucius. And I just want to say, I, I, I have a little Confucius uh, proverb. And it's, man who eats crackers in bed have crummy night's sleep. Just saying. <laughs> but so we were reading. We've got to lighten it up a little. It's been pretty heavy so far, right? So... So we're reading these different books. I was actually very intrigued by reincarnation. I thought that um, I had been reincarnated many times, and this was, was my first go-round as a woman, and so that's why I was so shaky at it, or maybe <laughs> some of the parts didn't make it all the way through in the reincarnation <laughs> thing. So, so I, I kind of leaned toward that way. But one thing that we did know is that we didn't want to have anything to do with Christianity. Because all we knew about Christianity was from the Christians that we saw. And the only Christians that we saw were the ones that were at the gay pride parades that we always went to. And every single time we saw these Christians, they were holding up signs. 
signs that said, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, because sarcasm always wins someone to the Lord. Homosexuals will burn in hell. God hates fags. And I always saw this one. It said LEV 18 colon 22. And I didn't know what that meant. I kind of thought maybe it was a scripture verse only because of the colon. But I didn't know what it meant. But what I did know is that I didn't want anything to do with their God. Because if the Christians are the ones that say they know God, and they're telling me God hates me, why in the world would I want to have anything to do with this God? And there we have it, ladies. The noise of a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And all I heard was the loud, obnoxious sounds of hatred. But what I didn't know is that God was bigger than them and he was bigger than those signs. And now I can share about how God met me right where I was. Praise the Lord. So in December of 2001, my only brother, Larry, was diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, it's very devastating to our family, and my brother had a neighbor that lived across the street from him that was a Christian, and this man would come over almost every day after work and start to share the gospel with my brother. So very shortly after being diagnosed, my brother received the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. He was the first in my family to get saved. So even though I saw the cancer basically killing my brother, his skin was turning gray, his hair was falling out in clumps, I saw this life come al alive inside of my brother and I didn't know what that was. It intrigued me and it scared me. So I just stored that in the recesses of my heart. Then on October 22nd, 2002, at 3.45 a.m. in the morning, it was my brother's 48th birthday, I was holding his hand in the hospital, and I watched him take his last breath. His death devastated me. Death became real to me for the first time in my life, and I was broken. And my girlfriend tried to comfort me, but when you don't know Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, how do you comfort someone when it comes to death? So a few weeks, maybe it was a month, I don't really remember the time frame, but shortly after my brother's death, as I'm trying to still catch my breath, those things that I stored in my heart were coming up now, and I started having these thoughts about God, and, and I had this one question in my heart that was burning in my heart, and I wanted to talk to my girlfriend about it because she wasn't just my lover, she was my best friend. She was the only person that I had been in relationship with that didn't hurt me. And she was the only one in my life that I trusted as best as I knew how to trust. But I was afraid to ask her because it could change the course of our relationship. The question was gnawing at me and I was afraid of losing her if I asked her this question, this woman of my dreams. But I had to ask, praise God that the Holy Spirit is bigger than our fear. So I rolled over in bed, and I looked her in the eye, and I said, Babe, do you think the way we're living is wrong? And she had this shocked look on her face, and I thought, Oh, no, what have I done? She's like, I can't believe you just asked me that. I was just going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> Come on, you guys. Come on. You cannot tell me that our God through the Holy Spirit was not present that day in our lesbian bedroom. There is nowhere we can flee from his presence and there is nowhere he won't come to save us. <laughs> praise the Lord. He is so worthy of our praise. So right there in our bedroom, we got down on our knees because I thought that's what the rules were. <laughs> we got down on our knees and we prayed, God... If you're real, will you show us? And if the way we're living is wrong, show us. So I'm like, you know, we should find a Bible. I saw my brother with one, and we had one in the house because we were Americans. 
So we went up in the attic to get it <laughs> and got it out of the box. And when we held it, we didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what a concordance was. And so we just, you know, we just kind of flipped through it. And then we settled, we settled on this one page. And I look up at the top, and there's this long word that's really weird sounding, and it says Leviticus. And I remember that I see on the left-hand side, I see this bold number 18, and our eyes fell on verse 22, right after asking God that question, and this is what we read. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And I just want you to recognize it says, it is an abomination, not they are an abomination. So again, we were stunned. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. At that moment, we believed God was real and that he had spoken directly to us. That's about all we knew. So after about a week, I wanted to know if the Bible said anything about women being together because I was like, well, that's just talking about men. Maybe we're okay, even though deep inside I knew better. So my girlfriend comes home from work and she's like, I, I worked with a Christian and I asked her the question about women and she told me that there's this book in the Bible called Romans and we should read chapter one. So we did. And when we got to verses 26 and 27, this is what we read. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, the likewise now connects these two verses, Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So at this point, we knew God was definitely speaking to us and we needed to find a church. So again, my girlfriend talked to someone at work and she told us about her church and it was called Calvary Chapel Old Bridge and it's in New Jersey. So we went looking for the church and it was a little hard to find because it's a Calvary, so it was a, a warehouse. You know, I was looking for the, for the white church and a picket fence, maybe a bell at the top, but it was a warehouse. And when we finally, I couldn't even follow the people in their nice suits because it, it's a Calvary. No one wore a suit. They were just in regular clothes. But we finally parked and, and went in. And I have to say, when, when I walked in, I was a little, I was excited and I was scared. Because you see, I didn't have church clothes. All I had was the men's clothing that I wear. I had not one stitch of anything from femininity. My underclothes, my outer clothes, my glasses, my shoes, my watch, everything I bought from the men's department. My girlfriend did not suf um, suffer with gender identity issues, so I'm thinking when we walked in, we probably looked like a lesbian couple. The big L neon thing flashing <laughs> on my, you know, collared button-down man's shirt that was always a little too big for me. The, the seams always came down to here, but I felt comfortable in it. But I got to say, when we walked in, we were not overwhelcomed and we were not underwelcomed. We walked in just like everybody else. So we went in and we sat down in the back because I thought that's the center section, so we better <laughs> sit in the back. And so we sat down and I was looking up on the stage in this warehouse that I was in, and, and I'm looking and I'm seeing a set of drums and a couple of guitars and microphones everywhere, and I'm like, where is the pipe organ and the lady with the bouffant hairdo? <laughs> because that's what I was expecting. I'd never heard worship music before, but the worship team came out and they started singing, and there was this young lady there, she was only 19 years old at the time, and her name was Gia Lucid and she was leading worship that day because that was her home church as well. Go Jersey! <laughs> but when the music started, it was soothing to my soul because I love, love music. But then when the words came up, oh look, there's my name. When the words came up, I saw the words on these screens and these words were talking about God's holiness and his righteousness, and his love for me. 
And when I tell you that ripped my heart wide open, for those of you who know Cam Newton, that's kind of like a Cam Newton <laughs> move right there. But it ripped my heart wide open and my heart was so hard. You needed a jackhammer, a jackhammer to get to my heart. And I just, I'm like, wow, God, how could you love me? How could you love me? I'm so, so dirty. I've done so many horrible things. So many horrible things I've allowed people to do to me. And I'm a lesbian. And after all, Lord, God, those signs said that you hated me. But God was moving in my heart to tell me that that wasn't true. The Holy Spirit was telling me how much he loved me. And ladies, love never fails. Love never fails. Amen. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So on January 19th, 2003, I prayed and asked God the Father to forgive me of my sins, for Jesus to be the Lord and the Savior in my life and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as many of you know, the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders that day. <laughs> Praise the Lord. At that moment, I went from darkness to light, from deception to truth, truth that God loved me and that truth set me free. <laughs> Amen. Right then, I knew that God's lover, love was greater than any other love I could ever receive. And that love caused an immediate, an immediate change in my life. That day, after 24 years of being addicted to drugs and alcohol, it ended that day, and so did my gay identity. My new identity was now in Jesus Christ. But I had no clue about Christianity or what it meant to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I wanted to know all I could about God. So I started devouring, devouring the Bible because I knew the Bible had the answer to every single question I'd ever had. But even in all that, I still had questions. And one of my biggest questions was, God, if you're telling me, and I believe you, if you're telling me that I wasn't born gay, then why? Why does it feel so normal to me? And God, will you please show me everywhere I've been deceived? I am tired, tired of being deceived, Lord. Will you please show me everywhere that I've deceived myself, that situations has deceived me, friends, media, anything that's deceived me, reveal it to me, Lord God, so I can renounce it with your truth. And Lord God, will you please show me everywhere I'm wrong and you're right because I'm pretty sure I have a lot of wrong thinking in here and I want you to correct that. I want you to transform my mind. So God was faithful and patient and loving as he walked with me and answered all those questions for me. Now because I was spending so much time with God in prayer and in his word, I was hearing the Lord's voice more clearly. I wanted to know all I could about him and he was showing me who he was by reading the word. And in turn, it was him first, but then in turn, I was also learning about myself. And that's when the Lord started to reveal the answers to all those questions that I was bringing before him. I was head over heels in love with him because he first loved me. Because I was spending so much time with God, I was growing in him like crazy. And he was showing me that I could trust him. I also realized that not all Christians were like the ones that were at those gay pride parades. Many brothers and sisters in my church loved me, loved me right where I was, and they were patient with me as I had major, major growing pains. I couldn't get enough of God, and the Lord never overwhelmed me with too much at one time. It was step by step he was sanctifying me, through his Holy Spirit, and he was giving me the desire and then the strength to be obedient in all that he was calling me to do. Now, eventually, the Lord, in his gentleness, showed me that I had to move out of the house of my now ex-girlfriend. And this was scary, 
but God showed me that I could trust him, and she understood too. Because on January 19th, 2003, she gave her heart to the Lord as well, and she has never looked back either. And she's actually almost a full-time missionary um, bringing Bibles into places that I can't mention because it's being taped, but Bibles in, into countries in their native language um, so that they can read God's word as well. And if she gets caught, she might not ever come home, but what a surrendered life she lives. It's so awesome, so awesome. But so after moving out of the house, I still remained very, very good friends with her. And the Lord allowed that for like five years, but we were still emotionally attached. And, and the Lord showed me eventually that, that I had to move out of the, I mean, that I had to separate um, completely in this friendship from her. And I will say that is one of the hardest things I had ever done in my life. And it was only after being obedient in that. I mean, we both cried when I went over and told her that. We cried and we cried and we cried. And we were both obedient to that. And it was after that obedience that the Lord showed me why. You know, it was that umbilical cord that we still had. But after that, that's when my other friendships started blowing out of the water and her other friendships did the same they grew and they grew and then that's when the lord started growing our separate ministries because we were obedient because we trusted him and we trusted him because he loves us we can trust god in all things he gives us the power and the desire to be obedient and then when we are he blesses us and listen to how he puts it in deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 and 2. And you don't, ha ha you don't have to open your Bibles if you don't want to. I want you to just really hear this. I don't want you to necessarily read it. And we know the Lord's talking specifically to Israel and Deuteronomy but, but Deuteronomy, but we can hold this close to our hearts as well. So it's Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. And it says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, and to observe carefully all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And that's exactly what was happening in my life, and that will happen in your life too as you obey and trust the Lord. So precious sisters, it truly is about trusting and obeying God. He's worth it. He's worth it, and he loves you with an ever lasting love and his love never never fails god bless you guys i love you thank you for listening